So, uh, French Revolution through the Reign of Terror. Um, this is here is a very famous uh, uh, picture of the of the King of France, King Louis the Sixteenth, uh, being decapitated by the guillotine. Kind of the symbolic uh, thing that we all remember about the Revolution. But there's more to it, and I hope to get into that here. So, to begin, two concepts, general concepts that help you make sense of the worldview that your average French person would have probably held by the time there's a revolution in the 1780s and 90s. Uh, so this term that, uh, that overall we characterize French society on the eve of the revolution is called the Ancien Regime, the Old Order. And what's interesting about this Old Order, in this, if you looked at France in the 1780s, is it very much was still a continuation of the old feudal system of organizing society. Remember when you did that book assignment on feudalism and you did that pyramid of the king, the nobility, the peasant class, and then you had some variations within the, 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 the peasant class and who could kind of come out of that. That still stays in place for the most part in France. And it stays in place really because of a couple of concepts. The first general concept that a lot of people from this time period, your common person would have how they would view the world, how they'd make sense of their place in it, is this idea called the great chain of being. What this was is it was an explanation, it was an organizer for how you fit in to the world you were born into. And you could be born at, at different points, obviously, but they would have seen all of creation divided into, first of all, that is which overseen by the Christian God, which would have been the God that they would have recognized. Um, they would have seen angels as supernatural entities that occasionally carry out God's bidding and interaction with creation. That would have been part of their <laughs> worldview. Uh, they would have seen kings, of course, because kings are the enforcers who carry out God's wishes. That would have been what any king would have told you if you asked them where they got their authority. They answer to God, um, and that's, that's their justification for rule. The nobility, which is the, the titled aristocratic class that lives beneath the king. Sometimes they vie with the king for power, as we know. Um, and then you have commoners, um, the, basically everyone else, people who weren't born with title, people who weren't born with, uh, with, with land and estates and manners, um, but commoners who had to kind of carve their way in the world. Some of them may have been more skilled, more professionals. Others would have been just laborers and farmers. And that's, by the way, the vast majority of the population. Animals and plants, even things like rocks, the great chain of being stretched everything. And what that means is that everybody has their place. And if everybody has their place, to step out of your place is a disruption. And that's how people of this time period, many people of this time period would have seen it. Now, Enlightenment philosophers, they're going to challenge, they're going to push back on this concept. But this is the governing concept that people use to make sense of their lives. Specifically to France, France has what's called the estate system. It's a social hierarchy and order within France. It's often characterized by a pyramid, which would be very familiar to you. The king would be at the top of this pyramid. They're kind of like an entity onto themselves, especially the king of France. King of France is a very desirable political position to be in when you compare it to the other monarchies of Europe, whether it's uh, the ruler of the Holy Roman Empire, which is kind of divided between Germany and Spain and, and, and Italy at some points, the, the King of England, the, uh, um, the various princes that would have made up Germany and Eastern Europe, it was actually pretty powerful and unified. France is a big place. It's a big unified place. Over 20 million people, lots of food production, lots of resources, all under the command, the absolute command of one individual, the king. First estate, this is going to be the church, the clergy, the, the members of the religious order, bishops, priests. Broadly, this could encompass monks and abbots and other people within the church that would have wielded power. They have power not so much in their population, which is actually quite small, only a fraction of 1%. So not a lot of people in the religious orders, but you would have interacted with these people. You would, they would have been available to you. The church and religious belief is very much part of people's lives at this time. Church also controls around 10% of the lands, a little bit more, a little bit less, depending on the time and place. 
Uh, so it's a significant political player because land control is everything in a, in a pre-industrial society. Second estate. That's the nobility, the titled aristocrats, the people who have manners, the people who have vast estates, the people who get to pass on title to their kids. They're about 2% of the population. About 30 to 40% of the land is controlled by the nobility. That's a significant chunk. The king is going to control many other big swaths of land. But the nobility, even though in France they're, they're kind of under the thumb of the king, and the French king because, like Mrs. Cart talked about, the absolute monarch, Louis XIV, the sun king, he's very good about controlling his nobles. The nobility still is a force to be reckoned with. They can't be totally ignored as political entities. Third estate, that's everyone else, which in France is a really, really big group. 97% of the population, roughly. They do control some land, around 20%, give or take, depending on the time and place. But that third estate, that everyone else, it's fragmented into many subgroups. One of which, the most powerful, and they're going to play a big role in the French Revolution, is what's called the bourgeoisie. This is the French middle class. <laughs> Oftentimes, this is your, your educated commoners, your lawyers, your doctors, your merchants, your people that can afford to send their kids to school, people that can afford to travel, people that can occasionally read books and interact with intellectuals. Many of the intellectuals are going to come from this class. Not all, but some. Some culottes, these are going to be your fairly small group, but steadily bigger as you get closer to the French Revolution. The, the urban laborers, meaning people who live in cities that do manual labor. They're not very educated, usually. Um, they'll often do jobs like construction. Uh, they'll work at, like, uh, in the, I guess the equivalent of retail. We don't, they don't have retail stores in the common sense, but... The, the, the making of uh, and transportation of food, the maintenance of, of daily life, a, a lot of the, the labor jobs that would go on in cities. And key thing to keep in mind is it, it's the 1780s. It's pre-industrial revolution. The vast majority of human life is out in the countryside. Life is still very much organized around just having enough food to eat. So please don't think there are huge chunks of the populations that just live in cities. That's not the case. The vast majority of the population is that third subgroup, peasants and serf, peoples who are tied to the land, they work for a feudal estate, they go to church regularly, they probably are illiterate, they don't have a lot of power, they don't travel and interact with ideas too much in society, but they are a big chunk of the population. This is a cartoon from the time, pay attention to this cartoon, it may pop up later. Uh, they're both kind of illustrating the same thing. And that thing that they're illustrating is, is the kind of sad but trying to be humorous commentary on the unequalness in French society. You see a guy on the left, he's kind of beaten down, he's old, he's got, um, he's got some sort of a pick. Um, he's obviously some sort of laborer, his clothes are a little tattered. Uh, the guy on the right, he's not in a good position. He's under a big, heavy rock, um, as, and as well as some other people. They're both talking about the same thing. And that is, the third estate, that third 97% group in French society, they're being oppressed. They're being exploited by the other estates. Who are those other estates? Can anyone remind me quickly? Church is one. What's the other? Nobility, yeah. King is not really mentioned here. King's kind of an entity unto himself. A lot of the common people would have had like an, an, an affection for the king. He's kind of like a fatherly type figure who oversaw stuff. A lot of times when there was social criticism, it's, it's those corrupt ministers. It's those nobility. It's the members of the nobility. It's maybe corrupt bishops. Somebody subverting the will of the king who really is on our side. So that a lot of times the French people didn't think that way. But they're being exploited. They're being ridden. The backs are being ridden. They're being crushed by the oppression um, of, of the clergy and the nobility. Just a quick look at the way the land is divided in France. Remember, you have the first estate, second estate, third estate. Even though the third estate is the large, large majority of the population, they don't con control nearly as much land. 
All right, so we're going to investigate why there's a French Revolution and how it comes about through three lenses. So before you just start copying here, I want you to think about this. We're going to look at why there is an economic crisis or a financial crisis, money and, and, the ex and exchange, economic networks and exchange. We're going to look at why there's a social crisis, a breakdown in the bonds that keep people together. And thirdly, we're going to look at why there's a political crisis, why the politics, why the governing mechanisms break down. So that's just a way for you to make sense of these next couple slides. So starting with finances and economics, I think it's useful to think of France's problems in sort of a long-term versus short-term um, division. Like all problems, um, if you look at things in isolated ways, if you if you just look at those singular factors, I think you can you can miss kind of a broader scope of what's going on. The revolution that happens in 1789 in France is kind of a long time in the making, and some some of these reasons let me put forth to you. First of all, there's the long term makeup of how the monarchy looks. Mrs. Clark talked about Louis the Fourteenth, the Sun King, and the the elaborate ornate construction of the Palace of Versailles. And all of those, um, those beautiful things that French monarchs built, particularly during the time of Louis XIV, the extravagance, court life, bringing all the nobles in so you can watch them, <coughs> having you know those, those plays put on where you're the star, building separate houses so you and your mistresses can go hang out and escape the, the pressures of governing. Um, all of that has to be maintained. And all of that is very much in place over the previous hundred years. So that doesn't just come about suddenly. It's not some extravagance of a king that happens in a short order. Also, there had been previous wars of conquest. Again, this is all before King Louis XVI, the guy who actually rules during the French Revolution, the guy who gets his head chopped off. This all happens before him. Um, seven Years' War with Britain, in some ways, this is kind of the first world war, you might say. You guys explored this briefly in one context in US-1. You called it the French and Indian War, and it was Britain fighting with France over control of the Ohio country and Canada and the St. Lawrence. And who's going to dominate North America? That's one theater. They were also fighting in the Caribbean. They were fighting in the East Indies. They were fighting in India. They were fighting in mainland Europe. Austria was involved. Prussia was involved. Um, uh, all sorts of naval battles were going on. France loses that seven years war, that equivalent to a world war. And it racks up a lot of debt. This all happens during the reign of Louis XV. Um, after that war, in the 1760s, France tries to get its financial house in order. It looks for loans and new lines of credit from European banks. It's not able to get those. France is considered to be a credit risk. You don't want to be a credit risk while having the obligations and expenditures of the French state. It makes it hard for them to get quick cash. And they're gonna need quick cash because, in my opinion here, this is just my opinion, the, big, the biggest single factor on why France gets becomes insolvent in the 1780s is it has an inefficient and corrupt tax collection system. It can't get the money from the productive elements of society to the treasury of the monarch. That in between, that getting the money collected part is really difficult for them. And this is partly because even though France is an absolute monarchy, ironically, the one area of French life that the king can't really just exact his control is the physical collection of taxes. That's done at the provincial, local, regional levels. And there's lots of little people along the way that can kind of take cuts of that tax revenue or what becomes tax revenue. You can have local accountants, you can have local governors and mayors and other people that can kind of tap into that, and there's no direct taxation that fills the treasury. Um, the nobility in France, this is a very key thing, they're not directly taxed. There's nobody actually showing up at a Duke so-and-so's estate and saying, ah, I see you have 432 acres of this land and it's cultivated and this portion is in wheat, this is fallow, this is barley, this is 
making wine, and we're going to tax you on a progressive basis. Nobody is doing that. So there's, there's not an efficient way to get revenue into the state. More short-term reasons. Bad weather. Uh, the 1780s has a number of bad uh, weather situations that really harmed the wheat crop. The French government at the time had tried to deregulate the wheat market and the bread market. Their thinking was, we're going to boost production. But when a bad weather pattern happens and it hurts the supply of grain, there's no big state granary, sort of social safety net for poor people to fall back on. So when the price rises and there's, there's fewer price controls, poor people simply can't afford to buy grain. So that's going to anger a lot of people. They also decide to subsidize. They decide to give money to the American Revolution. This is great for Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and George Washington, who are desperately trying to win independence from Britain and a whole lot of other people. But it doesn't benefit the French monarchy too much. Yes, it knocks Britain down a peg. They have to expend blood and treasure to maintain their colonies, which they eventually lose. But does that really strengthen King Louis's hand? Does that enrich his treasury? Not so much. King Louis and Marie, and this is where I think it might be a little bit unfair to judge them so harshly, they inherit a lot of these expenditures. They inherit the Palace of Versailles. Remember, Mrs. Clark said their whole life is really essentially like getting married as teenagers and then being put in charge of a multi-billion dollar corporation and saying, have fun, don't screw it up. By the way, it's insolvent. It's really harsh to judge them on that because yes, they spend, yes, they're a little bit reckless. They don't have control of a lot of these, these elements coming in. So I just would think you should fold that into your thinking. Here's a cartoon from the time. Pay attention to this one. This is King Louis here, uh, the gentleman in red, and then his finance minister, a guy named Jacques Necker, who is really kind of at a loss for figuring out France's uh, financial problems, or at least solving them. He's making fun of the idea of a deficit. They're, this is kind of like a, a, a room of the treasury, and he's wondering where the money is, and it's it's been spent. It's basically Louis not mining uh, the treasury, and Necker trying to figure out how how it can be fixed. Um, so, second, social crisis. Why is there a social crisis in France? Why are the bonds of society fraying? One explanation is that the Enlightenment thinkers, what we talked about during the scientific revolution, they're getting more and more traction. Uh, and they're getting traction in France. There's a lot of French Enlightenment thinkers, Voltaire, Rousseau, um, as well as English ones, John Locke, Thomas Hobbes, many others. There's an increasing skepticism, an increasing uncertainty towards the idea of authority. And by authority, I mean political, the rights of a king and a government to do things to you against your will. There's, there's skepticism of that. And there's also skepticism towards religious authority. The church is going to find itself under attack. There's going to be seen as... There's a perception of corruption within the church hierarchy. They're sitting on lots of land. They don't pay taxes. And they're perhaps exploiting people, so on and so forth. A lot of these intellectuals, these Enlightenment thinkers, are beginning to cross-pollinate their ideas. Anyone who can write a pamphlet essentially has an audience. This is kind of the equivalent of the Internet of its, of its day and age. If you can get access to a printing press and you're pretty handy, uh, you know, conveying your ideas in succinct ways, uh, you can be a public intellectual. You can influence the public dialogue, and people are going to listen to you. Thirdly, there's greater optimism about humanity. This may not seem like a big deal, but it's a kernel within Enlightenment thought that, that has some pretty profound consequences for that. If you were to go back to the Middle Ages, the common belief was that humanity was deeply flawed, and they could not be trusted, and you had to fall back on that great chain of being. You had to kind of just be born into your place and, and honor your position in society and hold up your end of the social deal, and, if, and when you die, there's a better life awaiting you. Enlightenment philosophers really push back on that idea. They really think that humanity has the potential for great good, and that governments and institutions could be restructured, redesigned in intelligent ways that harness the capacity of people to do good. It's op it opens up the idea that you can 
have democracy and republican government and self-government, all of those things that are at the core of, say, the American Revolution. And there's a belief in natural rights, the idea that people are born with certain rights that even a monarch, even a king or queen, can't impose upon them. Though the English philosopher John Locke is going to famously argue, everybody is born to life, the right to life, liberty, and property. The state must respect your, your, your life. It, uh, it, might, it must respect your liberty, your ability to, to, to act freely in a society without restraints, and your property. That's a big deal when you factor it all together. There had also been, this is also going to contribute to the social frame, there had been other successful revolutions. If you're an intellectual who could pick up a pamphlet or read a history book, you knew that England had had two successful revolutions. They had one in the 1640s, really bloody civil war to go along with it. They had a more peaceful revolution in the 1680s, which actually got rid of the king again. Um, and you knew about the American Revolution. You knew that the colonies had pulled off a kind of miracle by getting independence from Great Britain. So there were other models out there to say, oh, they're doing this. I wonder what we could do. Finally, there's resentment towards the clergy. I talked about this. There's a perceived corruption, particularly within the French Catholic Church. There's some sort of extravagance, and they're not paying their fair share, and that there's exploitation going on. Okay, there's a lot of stuff here. You don't need to get every one of the subpoints, but I want to give you five key moments. Five key moments that bring about the political crisis of the French Revolution. We've looked at economic, we've looked at social, now I want to look at political. So the first of these moments happens in the spring, summer of 1789. At this point, King Louis finally reconciles him, his, himself to the idea that France is insolvent. The finances just aren't adding up. He's going to need to increase taxes. He's going to have to get a new revenue stream to keep the ship afloat. Louis calls a meeting of what's called the Estates General. The Estates General is kind of the equivalent of the French Parliament, although it, it doesn't meet regularly. It meets like at this pace like every hundred years or so. So Louis calls it together. He's, he probably sees himself as doing a generous, forward-thinking thing here. He sees this as, I'm going to bring the first estate in, the clergy. I'm going to bring the second estate in, the nobility. I'm going to bring the third estate in, the bourgeoisie and the, the educated elites. And we're all going to come to a consensus. We're going to hammer out some tax increases, and we're going to pull things together. This is not what happens. What happens is, is when the estates general meets, they decide right off the bat, that every estate is going to get its own, it's an equal vote. What percentage of the population is the third estate? Can you remind me of that figure again? 97%. They're not going to sit quietly and accept the idea that they get an equal representative vote in this estates general with the clergy and the nobility. They're going to demand greater representation. And that's really at the core of their disagreement. They're also not going to agree about taxes. The third estate pushes for direct taxation of the nobility. The church and the nobility say no to this. And that's really the, the intractable problem here, is they walk away from the idea of direct tax and taxation on the nobility. And it causes the king to make a fateful error. He shuts down the estate, estates general. He locks the third estate out of the meeting room. The third estate doesn't take this and just walk away. They continue to meet. The representatives of the third estates, these are the journalists, the doctors, the lawyers, the people who are educated in society but not titled aristocrats. They continue to meet, and they meet in one of the gymnasiums or the tennis courts of the king in Paris, and they declare themselves to be a national assembly with the ability to pass laws. So they all get in a room and they say, we now have the ability to make laws. And by the way, we're not going to leave. We're not going to cease. We're not going to stop meeting until we pass into the Constitution. Now, that seems like maybe a, an aggressive form of action, but it actually is kind of moderate. It's, it seems like at this point that you're going to have to give the third estate a little bit more representation. Nobody's calling for violence quite yet, at least not major voices. But violence begins to happen. 
in the streets of Paris in the summer of 1789, July, some groups of angry Parisians bust into the big state prison in Paris. It's called the Bastille Prison. It's a historic prison. It's very kind of ominous looking on the landscape. And they're very fearful that the king is going to try to subvert the National Assembly. It's going to try to shut them down. There's some rumors that the king is surrounding the city with soldiers and artillery, and they feel they need to get their, take care of their own protection. So they try to steal gunpowder and muskets, and in doing so, they just so happen to kill the warden of the prison, and they let out the prisoners, and they kill a bunch of other people, and they parade these people through the streets, and it's a really kind of bloody, ugly scene. This is, by the way, if you've ever looked at a calendar and wondered what Bastille Day is, it's kind of like the equivalent of France's Independence Day. It's 4th of July. That's what they look to as their symbolic start of the French Revolution. Meanwhile, National Assembly still doing its National Assembly thing. They're trying to engage and carry out a moderate revolution. They compose what's called the Declaration of the Rights of Man as Citizen. You talked about this briefly in your article. It's an attempt to try and create a French Bill of Rights. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, who's the United States ambassador to France at the time, he's in Paris at the time. A lot of uh, these members of the National Assembly will like go over to Jefferson's apartment and they'll say, you know, can you look this over? Can you give suggestions? And he'd write back his suggestions and they'd be like, I think we've got to go this way. And he'd be like, I think we need to go this way. And there's this, this dialogue kind of going on. It's kind of weird. He's the ambassador and he's kind of giving pointers to revolutionaries at the same time. Um, but they try to enact this new document that is based on enlightenment principles. Um, and finally here, even though there's this kind of like moderate revolution going on with the National Assembly, things are still violent in the streets and the Women's March on Versailles is one example. I'm going to show you a short clip here. But a mob of Parisian women, sans culottes, of the sans culottes class, laborers in the city, who are angry about the price of bread, they decide to march to the king's palace at Versailles, which is, you know, 20 or so miles outside of Paris. And they go there initially protesting bread prices, but as they go, they get increasingly worked up in revolutionary fervor, and there are other people that kind of jump in along the way. And by the time they get to Versailles, it's an angry, violent mob that busts into the palace and is looking for Queen Marie Antoinette, who they never really liked because she was Austrian and she never quite fit in at the French court. Um, and she manages to escape, but the royal family is kind of hostage to this mob. So I'm going to just show you this clip here of the Women's March to give it some context. The king and queen were at the mercy of events which had moved beyond their control. Less than three months after the fall of the Bastille, Please don't think just because there's this women's march on Versailles and it seems to look rather violent at this point that immediately we, we jump to the stage of the king and queen are the enemies of the state and they are immediately going to be executed. That's not the thinking amongst the ordinary French people. There's still a belief that we have this national assembly, these people who marched on Versailles were kind of rioters and it's, this is a mob, and the average French person still had an affection for the king. They may have always hated Marie, but the king is still a significant figure. Remember, great chain of being, the estate system, the king is something worthy of respect. So the National Assembly, I want to just focus back on that because that's the political story going on here. The National Assembly are, remember, members of the Third Estate who agreed at the tennis court that they were going to keep meeting until a constitution um, is formed. They passed the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. They even get... They even get King Louis XVI to sign the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. And for an observer at the time, you could have reasonably thought, okay, we're going to stage this moderate revolution, we're going to take power away from the nobility and the church and the king, we're going to have a constitutional monarchy. And that power will uh, be able to be kind of preserved. And there won't be this escalation of violence. So the National Assembly, however, this political body has factions. There are two kind of parties that emerge here that I'd like you to be familiar with. The moderate faction, the ones that, that is the majority for the time being, is called the Girondists. They're the moderate group 
that favors, yes, a Republican form of government. They want to see self-government. They like the idea of an elected legislature. Obviously, that's what they're taking part in. But they believe that the monarchy can be preserved as a, as a force of state, a, a, a stabilizing force in society. It doesn't totally pitch out that whole social system that people had gotten so used to. Another group, the Montagnards, which means men of the mountain, is a much more radical faction. They tend to come from a much broader group, which, and I'll use these interchangeably here, a broader group called the Jacobins. To be a Jacobin meant you were a member of this elite debating society in Paris at the time. A lot of intellectuals, lawyers, professionals would have been part of this. And they tended to favor a radical restructuring of French society. They wanted to restructure and limit the power of the church. They wanted an egalitarian society free of feudal distinctions. They wanted to, uh, you know, restructure the government where that extended rights to everyone. And they wanted to remake French society. They were the minority faction early on. They were kind of like the radicals screaming in the corners, but they're going to make progress. The Jacobins are going to reject, and this is their critical distinction. The Jacobins, Montagnards, are going to reject the continuation of the monarchy. They're the ones who really push for the idea that the king can no longer exist if the revolution's going to succeed. And that's going to be a real source of division. Last slide. It came up yesterday in yesterday's discussion. Why violence? Why does the French Revolution become this kind of scary, odd-looking thing of mass ex public executions, the guillotine, uh, blood being spilled, seemingly out of control mobs? That was the distinction your author made, is that the American Revolution was this kind of sober-minded people and state legislators getting together to protect property and extend liberty and self-government versus the chaos of the French Revolution. So here are, here are some explanations for why the French Revolution becomes violent. Number one, the king makes a fatal mistake. King Louis is kind of playing along with the National Assembly up to this point. He goes along with the idea of declaration of the rights of man. Uh, he kind of is open to the idea of constitutional government, at least outwardly. But ultimately, he's persuaded, perhaps by himself, perhaps by advisors, that he can't see his power wither away. That he needs to make a move that restores himself to his absolute state. And Louis miscalculates. To do this, he thinks he, thinks he can pull it off. But to do this, he needs to get to a foreign government. He needs to get to Austria. He needs to get to Marie's family connections in Austria. And he thinks that if he does that, he can get outfitted with an army march back into France. Some people will join him, others may not, and he'll reinstate his, himself on the throne. Again, perhaps this is his own thinking, perhaps he's getting advice. Either way, he does this. And this is a dramatic miscalculation because it turns the average French person against King Louis. It makes Louis look like a traitor. Louis is colluding with the foreign power to terminate the revolution. That's at the end of the day what people conclude. Louis has betrayed France. So he's captured. He doesn't actually make it to Austria. Him and the royal family are then taken back in custody. Only this time it's not sort of a, a house arrest, but we still want to keep you around sort of thing. It's more like a house arrest. Your future is now in jeopardy. Uh, the Girondists, however, still control the National Assembly, but their power is they're losing it by the day. And that's because the National Assembly goes to war with Austria, Prussia, the Netherlands. Um, England is running a blockade at the time. France is at war with a number of other outside powers. And the outside powers are pretty much saying, we want King Louis back. We don't like this idea of overthrowing the monarchy. Um, if, if a hair is harmed on his head, we will conquer France and we'll terminate the revolution ourselves. So France is at war. The Girondists are blamed for the poor performance. Austria is, has invaded France. They've taken a huge chunk of its eastern borders. And it, is, it, it appears as though they might take Paris, actually.
So King Louis, during this time, is seen as a divisive figure. He's put on trial for treason. And this really divides the assemblies. Because if you are a moderate, you may have thought that it's possible to have a moderate revolution, that you could have kept the king, you could have had a constitutional monarchy based on republican principles. That doesn't seem possible. The Jacobins, the Montagnards, now have the upper hand. They can blame you for the war, and now they'll now blame you for defending the king who's a traitor. They succeed in executing the king. You see the picture right up there. The King Louis is sent to the guillotine in January of 1793. Marie is sent there in October of 1793. The monarchy is no more. But the Jacobins and the Montagnards are now in control of the French state. They have the levers of power. Robes, Maximilian Robespierre, a very prominent lawyer who's very... Um, uh, outspoken member of the National Assembly, he's going to catapult to a position of leadership in this new Jacobin-controlled government. And since they're at war with all of these different outside powers, they feel as though they need to protect France internally as well as externally. They need to protect the revolution. They really look at this, and we're going to see this in the clip here, they see this as their big opportunity to remake French society. If the Enlightenment principles are going to succeed, the outside powers who King Louis tried to conspire with, they can't smother the revolution. So they see themselves as defenders of really um, the future of humanity. That's how they might have put it. They form what is called the Committee on Public Safety, which is kind of this uh, ominous sounding body. Um, and it has the power to arrest people and execute people for being enemies of the revolution. And Robespierre is going to sit on this committee, and this period of 1793-94, I only mention those dates to give you some context, that's going to be the high watermark of Robespierre and the Reign of Terror. That's when a lot of the killings, that statistics you guys read from the reading, the 17 to 50,000 people, that's when it's going to take place. And again, Robespierre's thinking is this. I need to purge dissent. I can't tolerate dissent. It's a risk to me. If this revolution's going to succeed, I need to purify French society from elements that might subvert it. So they see it, they're, they're in like full kind of lockdown, preserve the revolution mode. 